top act, I mean, top target in China's genocide act is repression against women. Uh, Chinese government targeting Uyghur women uh, by dehumanizing them, raping, forced sterilization, forced abortion, and the worst case is forced marriage. Um, regarding this uh, repression, the Uyghur human rights research did a res um, human rights project did a research. The key findings of the research is. Chinese state media videos, government sanctioned stories and accounts uh, from women in the diaspora offer evidence that the government incentivized and forced inter ethnic marriages have been occurring in, the, in East Turkestan since 2014. Evidence suggests it is highly likely the Chinese government is systematically imposing forced inter ethnic marriage on Uyghur women. The Chinese state maintains that inter-ethnic marriage promotes ethnic unity and the social stability. However, evidence indicates that the government's program to incentivize and to promote inter-ethnic marriage is, in fact, a tactic intended to assimilate Uyghurs into Han society. <clears throat> so finally, forced and incentivized, incentivized marriages in the in East Turkestan are forms of gender-based crimes that violate international human rights standards and the further the ongoing genocide and crimes against humanity being committed in East Turkestan. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. In closing, we would like to express our thanks to the tribunal jury for volunteering their time, especially Sir Jeffrey Nice, Nick Vetch, Tim Clark, Professor Raminder Carr, Professor Dane Parvin Kumar, Professor David Lynch, Professor Ambrina Manji, Professor Audrey Oscar, and Catherine Brown. Their contributions are truly historical. We would also like to thank each and every person and member of the press who joined us here today. In particular, the courageous reporters at Radio Free Asia, we were service, who worked tirelessly to expose the truth of the genocide and ongoing atrocities, often at the cost of their own families. The tribunal and its findings are vital to the highlight for the sake of a more just world and each member of the media has a vital role to play in the spreading the truth. And thank you also to our guests from the State Department DRL and Office of Global Justice who have joined us here today. And for the vital dedicated work that they perform in pursuit of a just and secure world. We hope that each person here will continue to be part of this effort. Thank you. And now we are open to Q&A. Uh, hi, my name is Jim Snyder. I'm with Radio Free Asia. Uh, I wondered if you guys had any sense of whether the lockdowns have changed since the protests, or are they still the conditions still the same in China? <coughs> yeah. Uh, we, um, <coughs> of course, there are some uh, video footages, Chinese propaganda that. Uh, there is some uh, the ease and of the restrictions, but uh, the, the reports we are getting from the uh, people, uh, uh, the, the, because there are people who talk with their relatives back home, uh, the, the, the lockdown is uh, still uh, very strictly controlled, and they are not allowed uh, to uh, to go out. So this is uh, happening in Urumqi. In Urumqi, they give some. Uh, 
because the attention of the international community is on the city, so therefore there are some movements, but in the other provinces, uh, villages, uh, it is still, lockdown is still on to, in place. I can take another question. <laughs> to add just uh, one comment to Mr. Rafanat's uh, comment. Um, so yes, in some parts we believe it eased, but you never know what's going to happen next. It might start again. And let's think about the agricultural products that hasn't been taken care of for four months, five months. All those corpses are gone. The animals that were not fed, they died. So there are so many other uh, consequences, uh, even though the people were released or like locked down and temporarily, there are so many other consequences that now Uyghurs have to deal with. Just would like to add to Erdogan's as well. Um, the, another the huge impact of the lockdown and just a slightly reasonable uh, loosening situation um, created another trouble for Uyghurs as well, and job discrimination against the Uyghurs. Um, since some businesses I came back to, um, not normal, but reasonably in order, but um, the, the job advertisements clearly written that they're not going to hire Uyghurs. I think for so many months lockdown and losing everything, and now if Uyghurs face job lose, um, that's going to be another consequence for Uyghurs to just to make a living and again it's not clear what's going to happen <coughs> next Thank you. yeah one thing is clear that you know although there is signs of some some <coughs> side uh, easing the uh, restrictions but uh, the genocide is uh, ongoing you know never <coughs> stop Chinese government has uh, not back off, so it continues what it has been doing for the last six years. Hi, um, I'm Atar Mirza from the Washington Post. Thank you so much for talking today. Uh, you mentioned in Urumqi uh, there were, during the fire, people were unable to escape, um, and then also some of the lockdown restrictions on your father. Can you detail exactly what lockdown measures were in place when in Urumqi, leading up to the fire and afterwards? <coughs> so I, I'll try to answer it in generally, and then Sulino can share her father's uh, situation. So as far as we know, uh, the lockdown in Urumqi uh, was four months, more than uh, three months, uh, closer to four months, 120 days approximately. Uh, and as we see from the video footages, uh, the most doors were sealed out from outside with wires and other uh, equipments. And also the emergency exits were also sealed, shut, uh, blocked streets, had cars all over. So it was kind of hard for fire truck to move in, for example. And the, the apartments building's entrance is also locked. Uh, those are the you know information we have. And people locked down, you know, locked in. They didn't have enough food, no access to medical care or medicines or anything else uh, so if you had money you could order food you know based on the policy however uh, Uyghurs were most vulnerable compared to Han Chinese and others and most of them are business people they work paycheck to paycheck uh, and when they don't work and stuck in the house for four months they run out of money and they can't order so that's the other you know perspective. And you want to add? In 
in my dad's situation, uh, he was locked down in Georgia, uh, which is a sensitive city uh, as far as the lockdown. And then uh, he stayed there for two months. Um, they let them go out suddenly for a day. So he had something to do in his office. So he went back to his office, and the lockdown started. So he just locked up in his office. So every day, he would like call me and video chat with me. But the only thing he was eating just was just the bread. And he was like, every day eating bread, and he can't, they can't call the lady because the doors are locked. Up. And if, if he had an emergency, even if he was sick or something, if, if they call, call the ambulance, they can't save him on time. And he might lose his life. But until now, I don't know how he, how he died because they didn't show my relatives his body or anything. They just took him away and I just got the news that he passed away. But I don't know about any detail because I can't reach my relatives in China, in, in the city state, because they, they, they won't let him reach, reach up us and con contact us because they, they still feel like they're in risk. If they contact me, maybe they will take them too. <coughs> so my, my, my relative in, in Mr. Kisan is still afraid about it. So I don't know any details about my dad passed away. I only know he passed away in his office. Thank you. Okay. Just to add that if you would like to know the magnitude of how bad it was, this is the lockdown besides the ongoing on genocide. Uh, <laughs> we have been having funeral ceremonies and prayers in our Uyghur mosque and in our Uyghur center every weekend. So many people lost their parents, their loved ones just recently. So the number of deceased or you know deaths are tremendously increased. And we think it's because of the lockdown. Thank you. I would like to get uh, one issue is there's a long term policy of the Chinese government, not only for the Turkestan River, but entire China. But problem is different. <laughs> Uh, Chinese government implemented some uh, one part of the genocide policy because there is a and uh, the Chinese people who live in Turkestan they have also and in fact a lot for the uh, uh, lockdown uh, and uh, all but they have at least sometimes uh, some little bit uh, opportunity to get buy food and secondly most of the Uyghurs who are in, uh, unemployed and they are most of the Uyghurs and the work in money for daily life, you know. So this food was not provide free, and you have to pay. So most of the Uyghurs no work opportunity, lockdown almost four months. They could not buy the food. This is the impact the daily life. This is the difference because most of the Uyghur, uh, Chinese people who live in Turkey they have uh, got the benefit from the government, and they have their employer. They have a salary, a government pay. But for the Uyghurs, <laughs> not this opportunity. Gordon from RMK has a question. Uh, from Radio Korea's Uyghur Service. Um, as you have just noticed, that uh, after the uh, Urumqi fire, thousands of Han China citizens, they took to the streets and they publicly demand to end the lockdown policy. However, among them, we didn't see any Uyghurs. Why those the Uyghurs who, who have suffered a lot from those lockdown policies, they didn't go to the street this time? Well, it's a good question. Of course, and uh, the Chinese government measure for such an event and the uh, restriction is a uh, measure is completely different for the Uyghur. If Uyghur first not allowed even this time also go to the street, if they go to the street, uh, uh, attend any such kind of protest, they are immediately labeled to the terrorists as separatists. Yeah, it's surely. Uh, but if the Chinese people and uh, went to the street, and this is different of level. They never believe the terrorists are separatists. So that's why, and there is a little bit opportunity for the Chinese people can uh, 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 they went to the street, hold such, such a protest. Uh, this is one reason, of course. And uh, 
second, another reason is most of the Uyghur young and uh, uh, generation is today is still this concentration camp, you know. Uh, so this is the second reason. Is that uh, the, the East Turkestan is Israelis' state? It's the people are either under control by the concentration camps, by the authority in person, or by technology. So that doesn't let any of them move a step because they made people so much traumatized because of the genocide act. Um, I don't think anyone has that kind of willingness to stand up immediately like as other Chinese people does because treatment is always there, it's different. Any more questions from the audience? The lady at the back. Hi, good morning. I'm Bayi from AFP, family reporter. Um, Avita, earlier you talked about, you know, Han Chinese people uh, sharing stepping up and you know showing solidarity with the Uyghur community especially after the Orochi fire uh, to what degree do you see this continuing um, especially with you know China moving away from the I guess the, the worst of its lockdown measures in other parts that you know caused a lot of these protests to happen across the country how do you see this progressing uh, in the month ahead? thank you thank you for the question uh, we're actually happy and pleasant that they finally you know stand up even if it's for their safety they do see uh, that CCP is handling many things incorrectly uh, so they stand up uh, however I'm afraid it's not going to continue too far uh, as you know uh, based on the some of the video footages we got that their students are being sent home uh, they do also get, you know, detained and arrested and started. And Chinese Communist Party, we're sure, will also crack down of those protesters and of those who are standing up for their rights and arrest them. So I don't see much of a bright future, unfortunately. However, the Chinese and all that are oppressed under CCP around the world in diaspora could continue. So there is a hope. Uh, we should work in solidarity and you know keep fighting for our rights until we all are free, until the concentration camps are closed, until this genocide ends. like to add to uh, Bilal as a um, Chinese outreach coordinator uh, to the Human Rights Project. Um, I think but one hope that I can see is <clears throat> at least um, Chinese people realize the uh, harshness of the Chinese Communist government's repression against just anyone, not just the Uyghurs. That's one point. Um, and also because this lockdown, you know, because both Uyghurs and the Chinese people had something in common, same supper, which is the physical, actual, real supper by the locking up everybody the same for Chinese people and the Uyghurs. At the same time, that lockdown makes them realize what the concentration camps look like for Uyghurs. So at least now I hear from Chinese people that lockdown the concentration camp, this, you know, is speaking out one thing but before it didn't happen we've been keep educating Chinese because we've been keep telling them look whatever happened to us is gonna happen to you next and <clears throat> our people are suffering in the concentration camp death camps and uh, you know whatever the Chinese government experimenting on us that means is they want to do something more so that's why we've been crying for support we've been crying to telling them that look you know what, the supporting skin speaking out against the Chinese government because of the Uyghurs suffer, it, it's not something that because you're just simply supporting the Uyghurs. In fact, you are supporting yourself. You're speaking out, you're preventing the genocide could come to you one day. So at least to me, um, this is a kind of alarm for the Chinese public, Chinese speaking world, that um, the, the lockdown is one step. 
there could be the concentration camp for them. So this is kind of Alan, but I feel that they may have to relax. Thank you. One more question. Yeah. I'm Haley Wilt with the Dispatch. Um, I was just going to get your thoughts on the implementation of the Weaver Forced Labor Convention Act thus far and see if you're talking to government agencies or like the executive branch about it. Um, any, any changes you want to see or, or updates you think are needed? Yes, uh, uh, according to uh, we had a meeting, a webinar uh, together with the undersecretary. Robert Silver, so who is responsible for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, carrying out of this, you know, enforcing this Forced Labor Prevention Act. So according to him, according to the commissioner, everything is uh, going smoothly at this time. But uh, <coughs> we think it is uh, because of lack of coordination with the other uh, countries. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it's not fulfilled what uh, is intended. You know. So therefore, uh, we are uh, asking the US government to ask other like-minded governments to pass the same, uh, you know, uh, re uh, legislations and, uh, you know, the co there should be a internationally a coordinated action Otherwise, these countries will uh, become at the risk of uh, becoming a dumping ground for the Chinese goods. Because the, now, you as the only country that uh, prohibits you know, entering you know, uh, Uyghur forced labor products, there is no other country in the world that is, you know, it, 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 there is a law and there is a, a enforcement strategy only in the US. In other countries, there is no other country which is, you know, prohibits entering uh, forced labor pr products or products tainted with the forced labor. So therefore, we are very happy. Uh, we uh, hope that it will uh, have this uh, effect that we want, uh, we intend it, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, until now, I think uh, uh, China is, uh, uh, hasn't, as I said, hasn't backed off. So it uh, didn't have, I think, the same, they, the uh, effect that we wanted to have uh, on China. So because uh, China is still the big brands are still in China, uh, although they know that they are, you know, aware that they, their uh, supply chains are tainted with forced labor, they haven't moved that they have been, you know, saying that they, are, they will, uh, there, are, there are news information that these uh, large brands are, uh, will you know leave China uh, and uh, 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 cut the, their uh, supply chain? But it hasn't happened as uh, we see. You know, it hasn't happened. So therefore, uh, uh, it is very good. To, uh, actually, it's a very powerful tool we have now. And uh, if other countries, if other like-minded countries in Europe, in Australia. The FDA, you know, cooperate with the U.S. and if they do the same thing and uh, impose the same uh, <coughs> uh, uh, sanctions on Chinese officials uh, and Chinese uh, companies, then uh, prevent or uh, prohibit Chinese, uh, uh, you know, forced labor products from entering their country, then it will become a very effective tool in, you know, uh, stopping China from carrying out this uh, on the genocide. We uh, returned just the, the, the 10 days ago from Australia, for example. Australia is uh, in uh, UN level, in international level, is very supportive of, of uh, US you know, uh, actions. Uh, in the UN, for example, Australia supported uh, uh, the resolutions which was uh, and introduced by Western countries, and also Australia was part of this 23 countries who uh, organized this side event in October. Uh, but uh, in Australia, the, even there is a, a Magnitsky 
uh, at least you know, Magnitsky have passed Australian Parliament uh, last year unanimously. Australian government used Magnitsky Act to impose sanction on Russian generals who uh, committed war crimes in Ukraine, rightfully. But they uh, didn't impose sanction on uh, any Chinese officials. So uh, this lack of international coordination will, you know, affect uh, the impact of the foreseeable Just to add to that, uh, as a part of the coalition to end the Uyghur forced labor steering committee, uh, we have been working tirelessly with the government, like government engagement, working with CBP, uh, also as well as, as Anad, Anad mentioned, uh, working with other countries uh, to implement this uh, and pass the similar bill in other countries and uh, contacting businesses to hold a single standard, as Anad, Anad mentioned, not to use other countries as a dumping ground. Uh, so basically what we notice is uh, the products coming from China reduced uh, and being hold at the borders. The data we receive from CBP don't match, you know, it doesn't match with the data we receive from Chinese media. So China still showing that they're still sending, you know, exporting lots of products, however, uh, most of them are, you know, hold, you know, at the borders, and also, according to what I heard from Amazon, even had forty percent decrease in their, you know, uh, products coming from China. So that shows that this bill is working, and that shows uh, everyone is trying uh, to stop the products that are linked to oil forced labor. And of course, there more needs to be done, and we're working on it. Just recently, uh, if you noticed, the auto report came out that shows most, you know, car companies, the auto industries, uh, are linked to oil forced labor. So we are looking forward to see the next, you know, level uh, how to work together to resolve that issue. Thank you. I would like to add a uh, small thing. This uh, Uyghur uh, Provincial Forcible Prevention Act is good, but the uh, problem is implementation and the tool of implementation is not good. Today. And but because we have seen uh, this year, last year also, uh, the business between China and US is increasing. So it is showing this law is not really uh, impacted very much for the company. The company <laughs> is hungry for the money. So, and the uh, uh, company cannot break, uh, bring the uh, protection from China to the to, to, to US, but through Canada, some other country. So that's why it should be implemented uh, and perfect to US government, uh, and also uh, should be uh, more, uh, more, more measures uh, and more staff uh, and the control and the, the mechanism and it will be effective. Surprised us was uh, you know we published a report you know, red dates report right, red dates report so what surprised us is that uh, in uh, 2020 U.S. government sanctioned XPCC Xinjiang production and construction codes a Bing Tuan which is a quasi military organization entity so. Uh, they pro, uh, this uh, red dates, uh, you know, being uh, exported by the uh, XPCC. Uh, even uh, uh, there is uh, the uh, logo of the XPCC on the uh, <laughs> but, but it is still, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the uh, grocery stores being sold. So this was, uh, you know, I don't know how they are going to implement that. You know, that uh, is we are, as uh, Dov said, we are, we are very happy, and as we heard from the officials, is it is being implemented uh, very uh, smoothly, uh, fully. But uh, but uh, we when we see this uh, products of forced labor, because uh, Bing Tuan is one of the entities in uh, in East Turkestan that you know 
suppress the world war and, and has a very big role in ongoing genocide against the Uyghur people and products which is uh, the product of the, uh, this, you know, this entity is still in the US market. So this is, uh, we don't know how they are going to prevent these uh, products for, from entering to the US. I, I was wondering, since that report came out, have you checked the stores again? Yeah. Like, are, they, are the red dates still in those stores? Uh, yes, yeah. they are still. <laughs> they are still on the shelves, unfortunately. Uh, however, we have meetings with Treasury Department and CPP and DHS and others that they are going to take, you know, an action for these violations and find like who is really responsible. Is that the shipment company, delivery company, or is the buyer? Like, you know, they're going to check the supply chain. I believe it's going to take a while. Uh, but yes, they are still on the U.S. shelf, unfortunately. And for Uyghurs, for us, uh, top of the ongoing genocide, and we're dealing with the survivor skill, we're dealing with uh, transnational repression. And another thing, like a slap to our face, is like, what? It's still selling on the shelves, and which was sanctioned two years ago. Like, this is something that U.S. government can prevent. You know, so we are taking, you know, the next step to work closely with the CBP and you know others to make sure this doesn't happen. Yes, as uh, uh, Bill Kun said, uh, the uh, homeland, uh, the border, uh, uh, custom and border protection, uh, uh, they need uh, you know money, they need stuff, and Biden administration asked uh, Congress seventy million dollars to you know. <laughs> implement the uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act. So, so we would like the uh, Congress to uh, approve it as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, our press conference is concluded here. Thank you, Mr. Gokun.